Today is Saturday and I'm just about to start reading Homegoing by Yar Jassi. So I wanted to start a new reading vlog so I could document and track my thoughts and kind of do a live review where I spontaneously talk about the book as I read it. Hopefully you all like these kind of videos. I definitely think they're really fun to do and I think it just allows me to capture my ideas in the heat of the moment in more of an authentic way. As I'm sure a lot of you know, in my last reading vlog, I was reading The Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead, which was an amazing, amazing book. I gave that one five out of five stars. I just thought it was a really powerful depiction of slavery in the United States. I definitely feel like I'm in the mood to read some more historical fiction now. So I thought that homegoing, it's not focusing. This is the problem when you film on your phone. Anyway, I thought Homegoing would be the perfect book to continue with. This one is more of a generational story. It deals with two sisters. One of them is sold into slavery. The other sister is married to a slave owner. I've seen a few reviews where people say it's a little bit difficult to follow because it jumps around between a lot of different perspectives. But I'm going to stay open-minded about this and hope for the best. So I'll read a little bit of it tonight and then I'll update you later on with how I'm getting on today and then over the next few days and again it's not focusing and then it focuses and it doesn't focus yes <laughs> fast forward a few hours and i have actually read a hundred pages this evening which is a lot more than i expected to read normally when i start a book it takes me quite a while to get into it and i don't tend to read too much all in one go but with this one I was just really captivated from the get-go and I just wanted to make a really good start on it. I definitely think there are parts that are quite confusing. As I said earlier, each chapter is told from the perspective of a different person who is linked to slavery in one way or another. Sometimes it can be quite difficult to actually work out who's who and what's going on and who's related to who. I definitely have to pay attention and concentrate quite a lot more than I did with the Underground Railroad. But I think in terms of what's actually happening, it's really intriguing. And again, it's a really good representation of power relations and race relations in the mid to late 1700s and 1800s. It starts off in a really symbolic way with the character of Ethia who's born during a fire. There's a lot of local superstition and mythology around these kind of happenings through the character of Ethia and then subsequent characters we learn about how the British people took control of the Gold Coast in Africa. They're basically living in this really massive castle, which is very luxurious. Obviously, they've gained a lot of profits from slavery. Those that are very privileged have all the things they need. And at the bottom of this castle, there is a really big, dark, disturbing dungeon. People are basically capturing individuals for one reason or another usually because they've been punished for something they're taken to this dungeon which is really tiny for the amount of people that are there so they're basically all just thrown on top of each other there are no toilet facilities they're not really given much food they're living in darkness surrounded by mud walls until the ship is ready to transport them from Africa to the Caribbean and to America where they'll then work on the plantations. A lot of these characters are women and it's really disturbing to see the way they're treated, the way they are abused. Like with the Underground Railroad, which I read last time, it's really hard hitting, very eye opening and educational. Just be aware that the scenes can be quite graphic. I'm definitely looking forward to reading more of it over the next few days. I'm not too sure how much I'll be able to read tomorrow or Monday because I'm working. I have quite a lot of commitments, but definitely later in the week when I've got a bit more time, I'm going to really crack on with this, read a bit more of it. Hopefully it'll continue to grab my attention and make me reflect on all sorts of historical injustices that we don't often read about. Fast forward to Sunday, it's currently about 10pm and I've read about 30 pages today which isn't loads but I've had a lot of commitments and it's definitely one of those books that requires a lot of concentration so even when I've had time to read it's taken me a little bit of time to kind of process what's going on obviously it's moving between a lot of different perspectives and sometimes it can be a little bit disorientating because it's not that kind of book where it alternates between the same characters perspectives like if it was alternating between two characters that's not too bad 
but actually every chapter and every perspective is a different character. Sometimes the different perspectives feel a little bit fragmented. It's almost like it's a collection of short stories rather than a narrative as a whole. But having said that, I really enjoyed the last chapter that I just read from the perspective of a character called Joe, or also I think he's known as Kojo Freeman. They're in the US. They're actually a family of runaway slaves. This part's really interesting because it references the Underground Railroad, which obviously I read in the last book called some whiteheads underground railroad so i feel like i had a bit of extra background context this book doesn't actually explain that too well in my opinion but because i'd read Colson whitehead's book it was kind of easy to figure out what was going on some of the runaway slaves have been captured and pursued and kidnapped because they're breaking the rules they don't have official papers there's something called the fugitive slave act which essentially punishes people who are either runaway slaves or people who are sympathetic to their cause. Some of them are trying to move further and further north, so from Baltimore to New York. Some of them are even considering moving to Canada, where it's considered safer than the United States. So I think those ideas around the Underground Railroad are really interesting. I'm really happy that this book has brought out that context. Today is Sunday evening. It's currently about half ten at night, and I've just finished reading a little bit more of you know it's happening again and it's not focusing um now it is i've just read a little bit more of home going i've actually got to the end of part one now and tomorrow i'll be starting part two the chapter i just read was about someone called abena or abina i'm not too sure exactly how you'd pronounce her name basically her great grandmother is effia the slave trader's wife who was featured in the first chapter of the book basically abena's father decided to run away from the lifestyle of a slave trader and moved to this small farming village in a different part of Africa. Abena is around 25 at the start of the chapter, and I found it really interesting to see how she was treated, because she's kind of seen as a cursed child. And there's a lot of superstitions and beliefs in this small farming village that seem to affect her lifestyle as well as the lifestyle of the entire community. The community seems to believe that whenever there's a bad harvest and they're not able to grow the crops they need to earn a living, then they think it's kind of a punishment for something that someone has done in that community. So it could be a Benner or it could be another character. By the end of the chapter, they're starting to take their destiny into their own hands by growing cocoa. But there are a lot of sacrifices that they have to make in order to do this. And I found that really intriguing. Obviously, I'm not going to talk about what the sacrifices are, but again, kind of linked to relationships and power relations. The sacrifices that they're making are very difficult on a personal level, but they need to make them in order to earn profit. So again, it shows the inequalities that existed between black people and white people at the time when the book is set. Fast forward a bit to Tuesday evening. It's currently about quarter to 11 at night. I've been reading for the past half an hour or so, obviously reading more of Homegoing. I'm still really enjoying it, and I actually think it is better than I expected, and I'm really appreciating the multiplicity of historical experiences and perspectives. Even though they are a bit confusing, I think they offer something incredibly diverse and the book is achieving a lot of different things and covering a lot of historical ground. The last chapter was really interesting because it dealt with black ex-convicts in America who were basically chained up and sent across to the city of Birmingham in the UK in the late 1880s in order to work on very dangerous coal mines. It was really interesting to see how Yajiasi compared and contrasted plantation work in the US with the mining industry in the UK, as there are a lot of similarities, but also some differences. One of the biggest similarities is, of course, the inequality that existed within the system. At the same time, the workers do have some level of identity, and they're trying to join a trade union in order to stand up for themselves and fight for better working conditions, as the conditions are very dangerous, they're breathing in toxic dust, and they're scared for their lives every time they go into work. They're also fighting for better pay, better living conditions more generally. So I thought that was a really interesting historical dimension to bring into the wider discussions around slavery. I'm looking forward to reading some more of this tomorrow, as it is actually my day off tomorrow, so I should have a bit more time to read. Until then, that's really all I have to say today. I haven't read too much, but 
what I have read has been really good. Today it's Wednesday about 9pm at night and I think I've probably just finished reading for the day as I've read quite a bit today and made some really good progress. I'm now on page 250. I think there are around 320 pages in the book so I'll probably finish it tomorrow. It is still a little bit inconsistent due to all the different perspectives, all the different characters. Some of them are a bit more interesting than others but on the whole it's still definitely grabbing my attention and I find it a really powerful book and the chapter I just read was about a teacher it was really interesting because he's basically a teacher that's born with a scar all of the students are speculating the reasons behind this and they've all heard different rumors no one can really know the truth until the teacher starts to clarify things and there was a really powerful passage in here about how we absorb historical knowledge and how it's always filtered through somebody else's mind as all the information is passed from one person to another person. During this process, some of the information is forgotten and left behind. Some of the information is skewed. So it's actually very difficult to know exactly what happened in history. It's actually a quote that I would like to share because I just think it really sums up historical fiction in general and how we should approach it. This is about the students when they're speculating the reasons for the scar and all the rumours they've heard and it says this is the problem of history. We cannot know that which we were not there to see and hear and experience for ourselves. We must rely on the words of others. Those who were there in the olden days, they told stories to the children so that the children would know, so that the children could tell stories to their children and so on and so on. But now we come upon the problem of conflicting stories. We believe the one who has the power. He is the one who gets to write the story. So when you study history, you must always ask yourself, whose story am I missing? Whose voice was suppressed so that the voice could come forth? Once you have figured that out, you must find that story too. From there, you can begin to get a clearer, yet still imperfect picture. So I think that kind of reflects how historical fiction is never going to be a completely accurate version or representation of history because it's actually impossible to be fully accurate. But obviously, as you start to bring different perspectives together and different stories together, you can find a more complete version of history. That's definitely something this book is achieving with its multiple perspectives which reflects multiple versions of history. It ultimately becomes the task of the reader to then piece together all the information they're given by Yargiasi and forge their own version of history. Fast forward a bit to Thursday evening and I've now finished Homegoing by Yargiasi. So this part of the video is going to be more like the review part. Obviously, I can't really say too much about the last part of the book, otherwise I'll end up spoiling it. But there was some beautiful, vivid imagery and symbolism, particularly linked to the elements of fire and water, which were also featured at the start of the book. So it kind of came in a full circle, which I really appreciated. In terms of my overall impressions of the book, I am kind of conflicted with how to rate this book. Normally, I am not like this. I'm not actually too sure whether I should give this one 3.5 stars or 4 stars. So it's something around that. The reason why I'm conflicted is because one of the things I like about the book is also one of the things I dislike, and it's the multiple perspectives. They allow the book to cover a lot of historical ground. So we learn about over 100 years of slavery and then things that happen beyond slavery as well, including the roots of modern racism. But the multiple perspectives also made the book seem quite fragmented. I think, as I said earlier, it almost seemed like a collection of short stories rather than a continuous flowing narrative, which is kind of what I expected, to be honest, because it's not marketed as short stories although it very much reads like a collection of them. Some of the chapters and perspectives were a little bit more interesting than others. I actually felt like the earlier ones were potentially a bit more interesting. I'm not sure if the final few seemed a little bit rushed. I didn't really have an emotional attachment to some of the characters that were featured towards the end. It was definitely a powerful and hard-hitting and eye-opening book, 
and it was educational so obviously that's great from a piece of historical fiction but I think it could have been even more educational if it had been easier to understand perhaps moving between different characters in the different perspectives is confusing but I think there were also historical references which could have been developed a bit more I just felt like the book could have benefited from footnotes at times particularly for people who weren't too familiar with the historical context I felt like Yaji Asi was taking some things for granted my overall experience of the book is therefore quite mixed I think it definitely covers some really important themes some of the themes are incredibly disturbing some of the scenes are horrific at the same time I think some things could have had a bit more context could have been developed further and I didn't necessarily like the fact that it was confusing at times either so everyone that is it for the vlog for Homegoing by Yar Giassi. please let me know what you thought of the book if you've read it or if you're planning to read it what kind of things are you expecting from it also let me know what you think of the reading vlogs obviously this is the second one I've done I hope you like it I think this one is quite long and rambly but hopefully I raised some useful points but I don't want to ramble on any further so thanks for watching everyone and see you all again in my next video or in the comments if you decide to comment